My name is Lacey Bromley. I'm a physical therapist. I'm from Buffalo, New York. Um, I started in MS actually just as soon as I got out of physical therapy school. So I was about 22 years old, and I met my, uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Susan Bennett, who you're going to hear from. And uh, to her chagrin, um, I am still here 14 years later, um, following her around everywhere. So I'm going to talk a lot about spasticity and weakness, and really what we're going to do is go through all of the impairments throughout the day. Um, I just got the first one um, out of multiple impairments that a patient with MS can have. Uh, and you'll hear a reoccurring theme throughout the day is that we really have to do a very comprehensive evaluation of the patient. Um, use all of our toolbox examination tools to come up with the appropriate diagnosis. So if a patient comes in with balance, and you'll hear this a lot with Sue, um, you guys think Patty walked a lot. You should wait until you see me. I'm going to go around this room about 75 times. Um, uh, as you heard from uh, Patty, um, uh, we have multiple impairments. And if we come up with uh, the right impairment, we can treat to that impairment. So if somebody has a balance dysfunction, it doesn't necessarily mean they should come in and just do balance exercises. They might just have spasticity and weakness that is causing them to trip. And we have to come up with that diagnosis, not, oh, they have a balance impairment. It's what is their balance impairment? They could have visual issues. They could have visual ocular issues. They could have ocular motility. And you'll hear this from Sue. Um, but really getting in there and examining all of the different um, impairments really leads us to our treatment. And that's kind of what you'll hear throughout the day. So what are our impairments? Well, I'm going to talk about spasticity. I'm going to talk about weakness. Uh, imbalance certainly is one of them. Uh, Sue's going to come up and talk about that. Diminished coordination, Sue's going to talk a bit about that as well. You can have sensory loss, which can add to balance impairment, um, but it also can lead to other secondary issues like wounds on the lower, uh, lower extremities especially. You can certainly have visual changes. Sometimes that's our first symptom that patients get, is they'll have an optic neuritis where they'll lose sight in one eye, and that certainly can cause some issues with their balance. Um, and you can also have some peripheral neurological changes. So don't, when we're looking at a patient with MS, we try not to blame everything on MS. If a patient comes in with pain in their lower extremity, I'm going to be doing a full like low back exam. And then I'm going to look at their sensation throughout their lower extremities and not just say, well, you have MS, so it's probably due to that. So we want to look a little bit broader. All of those things can lead to things that result in um, increased falls, which is certainly something that we don't want to see. Uh, it can lead to decreased quality of life, which is basically what a patient's number one priority is. They want to live a healthy, happy life. Um, so all of these things that, all of these impairments that we'll be talking about today really impact their quality of life, and that's what we want to turn around. So how do we manage mobility? Um, well, certainly we have our rehab, rehabilitation therapy, which I'll walk you through in this section, how we specifically treat uh, patients that have weakness and spasticity. But we have other things under our, our belt as well that because we have this team around us that we can start to communicate with and ask for. So assistive devices, we can certainly uh, prescribe. They usually, I'm not sure in um, Canada if this is true, but in the United States we have to get, usually get a script so that the patient can be covered by insurance. Not because they can't go pick one up at CVS or the, the corner store, but because uh, a lot of them get a little bit more pricey, especially as you get into the walkers. So we ask a doctor for a script as needed. Um, exercise, we can prescribe just plain old exercise. Uh, you'll hear Sue talk about at the end of the day, about 20 minutes of moderate exercise can increase BDNF, which is a neuro, neurotropic growth factor in the brain. And that can help with our motor relearning, our motor organization. That is just pure exercise. They don't need specific rehab for that. We might need to bring them in for rehab, show them what exercises are safe, where their safe level is, and then send them away with things where uh, they just do exercises that they like. Then we can also advocate for our patients on medication management. And I'd like to encourage you to do so. If you get to a stopping point with a patient, say they're so spastic, you just can't even range them. They're tripping all over the place. We're not going to change spasticity, and you'll see that. Spasticity isn't something that a therapist can necessarily 
reduce. We can stretch them prolongly. It might last a minute or two, and then they're back to being spastic again. I see a lot of people like, yep, I, I'm not the only one that feels this way. I have a patient, you'll see him on here. He's so spastic, you stretch him for 30 minutes on a mat, he rolls over, and that just that effort of him rolling, he's back like this again. So you've wasted 30 minutes of your time trying to do something that you necessarily can't do. So we often ask for medical management of spasticity. If we think we've gotten to that wall where we're just not gonna go any further, we can communicate with the neurologist or the nurse or the PA and say, you know, this patient's just not progressing any further. Can we get baclofen on board, an oral antispasmodic? Or um, in our uh, area, we actually do what's called spasticity clinic where they go in and they see a neurosurgeon and we look at both orals and then also surgical management, which is usually an implantation of a baclofen pump. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's also delfampernine, um, which is considered the walking pill. It's a medication that increases action potentials, and it's been shown effective in increasing walking speed in MS. So if we think, I like to bring this on board as soon as possible. It doesn't work for everybody, but you don't know until you try it. So if somebody is having a small amount of problems with ambulation, that might be the, the, the time that we start to say, have you tried delfampernine? Why don't we try it? It's worth a try. Um, there's not a lot of big side effects with it. So we might advocate for our patient to get on that as well. So we have other things besides just our rehab. But the rehab is important. I want to preface this by saying this is not a full eval, but um, this is just uh, my friend Andy. He's doing some manual muscle tests. He's kicking out here, and you can see his right side looks pretty good, right? I'm saying about a four out of five strength. Um, so I just go through like a quick manual muscle sc test screen. I don't do specific muscle groups at this point. Now I'm gonna go over to his left leg, and you can see he's just getting no lift there at all. He can kick that leg out, but it bounces at the end, you saw that? So as he kicks out, he bounces. So probably more spasticity that's doing that work than actual muscle strength. And he can't really pick up his anterior tib at all. So this is just showing you, I check active range of motion, passive range of motion, manual muscle test, here's his upper extremity, his left upper extremity is also involved. He presents almost like a hemiparesis, um, just like a stroke would. Uh, so I'm just going through active range of motion. I don't believe I do any strength testing through his upper extremities there. Um, and then I'm gonna lay him down. So that was strength. I'm looking at active range of motion, passive range of motion, manual muscle test. Now I'm going to look at some spasticity, I believe here. Nope, I'm just gonna, okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm laying him down side lying and I'm asking him to bring his knee to his chest just to see if he's like a two out of five in that lower extremity but he doesn't even do that. That was more me passively ranging him. So he's really weak in that left side. So now I wanna check for spasticity. So here's a, just a quick check of spasticity. You can see a little catch and release there. So I'm just bringing him into knee flexion very quickly to see if he has any spasticity and he's got a little catch. Um, he doesn't really have anything in the anterior tib. So he's, his spasticity really isn't the problem. It is pure weakness in his case. Um, and then there I was just doing some proprioception, which Sue will talk about a little bit later. So with Andy, it is mostly weakness, and not just lower extremity, but upper extremity and core. Um, because of that, he does have a tiny bit of spasticity, um, but not, not my main concern with him. So weakness in MS can unfortunately present itself in multiple different ways. So it can simply be lack of force. So as you saw with Andy, he's sitting there trying to pick up his, his hip flexors and they're just not even going against gravity. So that's just lack of force. But you can also see a patient with just more of a lack of endurance. And that's usually when they say to you, they're sitting in the office and they say, I trip over my toe every day, like five times a day. You do an anterior tib test, and the anterior tib is a five out of five on that first rep when you ask him to just hold. 
So what I normally do is I'll, I'll, I'll document that as a manual muscle test of five, but then I might ask him to walk for me. You know, do a two minute walk test. We has to walk for two minutes. And all of a sudden you start seeing by the 30 second mark, he starts dragging his toe, right? And then all of a sudden it's like, it doesn't even just pick up. So that's a fatigue, a repetition over time. And you wanna, you wanna evaluate that. You don't wanna just go off of a manual muscle test um, where you get that number one force because those action potentials over time can kind of reduce uh, depending on how much of uh, the sodium and the calcium and the potassium stay within the nerve, right? So the very first time it might be really great. Over repetition, not so great. Then we can have just pure lack of motor control. Um, I believe Sue talks a little bit about how many areas of the brain are involved in moving a muscle, right? So we, when we want to move our arm in a specific way, our motor cortex has to send that signal, but it's modified by the cerebellum, it's modified by the premotor cortex, by the, what sensory information is coming in. So all of that has to come together for me to move my arm directly so that I can pick up a cup. It's amazing what the brain does. I tell my, uh, my students this all the time. They always look at me like I'm a nerd, but I'm always like, it's amazing. But motor control could just be the issue there. So it's not that they don't have force or that they, they fatigue at all. It's just they literally can't coordinate all those muscles to actually do the task at hand, and it can present itself as a weakness. You can have range limitations due to spasticity. So they could just have a tight gas rock, and that causes their anterior tib to stop firing as much as it should be. So they could trip over their toe that way. You can purely, you can have cognition, and we will have um, Chris come up. Uh, she's the OT that deals a lot with cognition in her clinic, um, and this is just the inability to, for them to apply uh, a force. You can see this in in dementia patients and Alzheimer's patients, where they're actually strong, but they just don't have the cognitive whereas all to actually initiate movement the way that they should. And then secondary causes uh, are the ones that we can really get at. So learn disuse. So, okay, my anterior tip doesn't fire, so now I'm just gonna wear a brace, like a, just a solid ankle brace. Now I've got disuse in my anterior tip. I'm not, um, not activating the muscles the way I should. Um, or I'm so fatigued, I'm tired, I'm weak, so I'm just gonna sit on the couch because it's depressing and I just wanna sit on the couch, learn disuse. We can have some weakness from medication. Uh, that's gonna be harder to differentiate and we should be talking with the doctor about that if they're on any type of antispasmodic or um, antidepressants or something like that. They could have some weakness or more, more fatigue than weakness. And then sleep disturbances, I can't tell you how important sleep is. If you have a patient that's telling you they're not sleeping because they're anxious or they're depressed or they just have pain during the night because they're so spastic or weak or whatever it is, sleep is the number one important, most important thing to your brain. And if they're not sleeping well, then we should be tr trying to address that in some way, either sending them to a therapist or trying to get them, there's even people that just do sleep therapy now. Um, and then obviously depression. Depression can just cause a lot of other issues as well. Okay. So here's my friend Mike, um, different than Andy here. So he has a right side, he, he's bilateral, but his right side is a little bit worse. So he's doing a um, manual muscle test with me. And you can see he can activate his quad pretty well, his anterior tib pretty well. Um, he is wearing a dictus, I think I take this off, so I'll talk a little bit about the dictus later. It's a, a, an a ankle foot, like a cyst into dorsiflexion. So it's just like a little rubber band that sticks around his foot that kind of helps it pick up. But you can see he's pretty strong in those muscle groups. So I'm just gonna give him a little bit of resistance. Not great, but at least a three plus, four, depending on what your uh, grading scale is. But he couldn't pick up his hip flexor at all. I don't know if you guys saw that in the beginning. I wonder if I can return that. <laughs> so here he's trying to actually pick his, his knee up towards his chest. So he's trying to activate his hip flexors. And you can see he really can't do that at all. Um, his other muscles are pretty good. I'm so you could say the same thing as Andy. Andy couldn't pick up his leg, right? But Andy's problem was mostly just weakness. He just couldn't activate the muscles. Um, 
So when we have a patient like this, we want to test them gravity eliminated. Um, so what I do is I lay him side lying, and now I'm going to try to break his tone. And you can see here, um, Sue is actually videotaping this with me, and she was laughing at me because he is so hard to break his extension tone. But now once I broke that, and I have him in, um, I have his joints in normal alignment, see how much power he has in that hip flexor? So I can't call him a five, but his anterior tip was good, his um, quad was good. If he has no spasticity, his hip flexor is a five. It pulls me right off the table. But when he tries to walk, he looks like this, and we'll see him a little later. So he looks like he's just so weak through all of his hip flexors, or all of his flexors in general. But you can see when he's in gravity eliminated or his tone is reduced by putting his joints in normal alignment, he really has really good, good activation. So his main issue is spasticity, not weakness. We still treat similarly, but in his case, we want to try to get some type of medication on board or something else because I can't sit there and stretch him for 30 minutes and then it lasts a minute. Um, he likes it, it feels really good, uh, but not really getting anywhere um, towards goals. So spasticity is velocity dependent, increase in muscle tone due to passive stretch, uh, characterized by an increased resistance to passive motion, and that's key when we test for spasticity. We really need to do a quick stretch during the motion. It's not just a slow passive range. If we do a slow passive range, we probably won't pick it up unless it's really bad, but we need to confirm it with a quick stretch through the passive range, and I'll show you the um, uh, modified Ashworth scale is what we use uh, to grade that. The patient, however, probably won't come in and say, I, I have spasticity, right? They probably say something like, I have this tightness in my calf, or I feel a pulling, or I have some spasms during the night. So they describe it a lot different than, uh, you know, I have this increased resistance to passive stretch. Can you check that out for me? So they usually use the words of tightness, pulling, tugging, aching. So spasticity just results from a, a lesion in the central nervous system. It's actually one of the only symptoms that can only be localized to the central nervous system. Weakness can be peripherally, centrally. Um, some balance issues can be peripheral or central. Um, spasticity is an upper motor neuron sign. So it's something that is going on where our cortex is no longer controlling all those descending pathways that then control the spinal reflex uh, within different levels of the cord. So we have this increased um, output of our uh, spinal reflex, our, our stretch reflex. So that happens. So we have loss of that decre uh, descending pathway. We have loss of control at the spinal cord level as well with that stretch reflex. But then also, as that happens and we have this increased tone in the muscle, you actually get muscular changes that cause our muscle spindle to be more sensitive to stretch. So now our muscle becomes uh, more sensitive to stretch, so it just kind of keeps getting worse if we don't address it, right? And that's why somebody can come on in with a contracture, because it's not just a one-time insult that then doesn't get any worse. So we can see increasing spasticity without increasing lesions. It's just that that one lesion caused increased firing of the action potentials out to the muscle, the muscle becomes tight, and the muscle spindle becomes more sensitive, and then it's just this cycle that just keeps happening. You can also see patients that just have an uncontrolled flexor response or extensor spasm. So you can see some patients, it's, it's more rare than the extension, but you can see some patients that just have like a, a withdrawal reflex that's just really exaggerated. Um, and then this causes a lot of energy expenditure, and it can cause pain. And we'll see, uh, I'm going to show you a video of Andy walking and why this might lead to pain as well. Just the tightness can lead to pain, but also the secondary effects of our mobility can lead to pain. So spasticity affects about 50 to 60% of MS patients, and it can be painful. Um, and like I said, we can advocate for our patient to add some type of medication on board to reduce that spasticity, whether it's anti-spasmodics, it can be anti-epileptic anti drugs, um, it can be just uh, pain medication, um, anti-anxiety medication, anything to try to damper the central nervous system's uh, response. And cannabis, of course, but I don't know a ton about that yet. 
I don't know if you guys know a lot about that up in here, up in Canada. Um, so, uh, like I said, pain. I got some laughs on that one. I don't know. <laughs> it's big up here. Okay. All right. It's not. I don't think it's legal in New York yet, but um, it's getting there. So pain can be caused by obviously by spasticity. There's very rarely central neuro neuropathic pain um, in MS. Thank God. That would be very. It's it's very painful um, and very diffuse, and the patient just can't really uh, tell you what it feels like. Uh, but more often than not, it's some type of musculoskeletal issue that's arised from all of this uh, imbalances of muscular weakness and spasticity that causes back pain, that causes shoulder issues, you know, all sorts of things. It's more often that, and I want you guys to think that way. When a patient comes into your practice and says, I have pain, I really want you to think musculoskeletal first and then maybe MS if things aren't, aren't working out as well. Um, it, headache can certainly be one of them, but I'd really uh, urge you to then check the cervical spine because a lot of our headaches are due to uh, cervical spine tightness. So definitely check that out. Um, yes, they can just have headaches and yes, it could just be MS, but we wanna do everything in our power to, to look for things that we can treat and then uh, again, advocate for patient medication if needed. Um, this is just says the same thing. It's just um, uh, listed for you a little bit nicer. All right, so how do we check for spasticity? So number one thing I want to tell you guys with spasticity is that it changes during every movement that they do. So you can't necessarily compare and contrast, and there's not a lot of inter-rater reliability um, because it just depends on what the patient's doing. But uh, the one time we do use a really big, what'd you say? I'm sorry. And how strong the evaluator, and how strong the evaluator is, as you saw with me and, and Mike. Um, uh, so it just depends on how, what they're presenting like that day. So what we use this a lot for is when we go to spasticity clinic and we do an intervention. So we can compare before and after. But really, other than that, we can't compare day to day as much. You can't even compare if they do a two minute walk and then afterwards, right? So pain, uh, full bladder can increase their spasticity, stress. I have had a patient come in that was so stressed out about her daughter getting married that her spasticity was just so out of control I couldn't even treat her that day. I had to ask her, um, I had to, ask her to take a little bit more baclofen um, for me to even get through any of the um, the interventions I had for her uh, and fatigue. So our main way of evaluating is called the modified Ashworth scale. Has anybody or everybody used that? If you can raise your hands who's used it. Okay, so I know how much to go through it. And then the spasm frequen frequency scale is actually a self-report of the patient that you can easily give them. So the modified Ashworth scale, we go through one passive range of the joint and we're elongating the muscle because we're trying to put the muscle on stretch. So if I'm doing my bicep, I do a, a passive range. Then I'm going to do a quick stretch through uh, mid-range. A lot of times I just do a quick stretch through the whole range, but just a quick stretch. You should feel if they do have spasticity, you can grade it at that point. So if they catch and release, so meaning no resistance on the passive range, then during the quick stretch you feel a catch, but then it immediately releases and then it's like, no, no resistance after, that's a one. If you have a catch and then resistance after, that's a one plus. If you start to passively range them and you're feeling resistance, that would be like Mike. It's at least a two. And then it's kind of like up to you if you decide if is it considerable resistance or just a little bit of resistance, that's a two to three. You still need to do the quick stretch to confirm that it's spasticity. So in our Parkinson's patients, we see more of what's called rigidity, which is just resistance to passive range, and they don't have increased resistance with a quick stretch. So we want to confirm that it's spasticity, not something uh, like rigidity, which would be something in a different part of the brain. Um, not that MS can, patients can't get rigidity. It's just we want to look for that spasticity with that quick stretch. So that's the modified Ashworth scale. And like I said, you can grade that on the first day of your 
um, evaluation, but the second day it's gonna be different. <laughs> so usually what we do is just increase tone in the gastroc, increase tone in the, in the soleus, uh, get, uh, quad, it's usually in those anti-gravity muscle, I'm sorry, uh, gravity uh, muscles. But um, like I said, if you're doing some type of intervention and you wanna compare before and after, then you can give them a grade and then grade them after. And then here's the spasm frequency scale. This again is just a self-report. You can ask the patient you know, how often they feel like they have spasms. Sometimes we can't even detect that they have spasticity during the evaluation, but they'll cl claim that they can't sleep at night because they have so many spasms. So this would be a good way to document that and then see if it changes with any type of therapy. So here's our spasticity management that we can do. We can do non-pharmacological stuff, which I'll talk about. We can do a surgical, uh, which is most often the baclofen pump, which I'll talk about. We don't advocate for any type of like tendon lengthening in this population. This is a progressive disease. Um, spasticity is not going anywhere, so we don't want to do any type of orthopedic surgery to lengthen tendons. Um, and then we have pharmacological, which again is antispasmodics, the most common being baclofen, but there's tons out there that they can use, and they can use combinations of, of uh, therapies as well. So again, dialoguing with your physician or your nurse, um, PA, uh, to try to get that on board. You can see Botox is there as the last one. A lot of MS patients have more diffuse uh, spasticity, so we don't wanna encourage a lot of Botox everywhere. It is a toxin. If they have some type of focal spasticity that's really bothering them, usually in the wrist um, musculature, then we might advocate for some Botox. But with diffuse spasticity, it's really silly to start shooting them up in every, and they can't even have that much um, because it is a toxin. So non-pharmacological, we can certainly do um, stretching, range of motion exercises. You can encourage them to get into yoga. The key is early intervention though with all of these. So if you don't, if you catch them like at the state of Mike, we can't do a lot of stretching at that point to really help alleviate it. Um, we need something bigger on board for him. Weight bearing, um, joint compression gives us um, a good stretching throughout the joint and a good input to the uh, sensory system which relaxes the joint. We can certainly work on positioning here, has an air splint, um, just keeping the arm in, a, in an extended position. But again, all of these things, as soon as you stop them, the, it goes right back, right? Unless we're strengthening the antagonist muscle to the point where it can actually control that flexion or whatever it is, um, it just goes back. Relaxa relaxation techniques might be helpful, especially before bed, if the patient's having some issues with increased tone at nighttime. You can have them do some meditation or mindfulness or relaxation um, to help with that. Intrathecal baclofen is really what we bring on board if the patient has more of this diffuse spasticity. So really, uh, what intrathecal baclofen is, is a catheter that's fed right into the spinal sac and it bathes the spinal cord. Usually at a lower level, it doesn't do a lot for upper extremity, um, mainly because the FDA and say you guys probably don't have enough. Yeah, okay. The FDA doesn't allow for us to go any higher than like T10 or Sue, am I wrong on that? T6? Okay, T6, it doesn't allow us to go. So it can't really get up to those cervical spine. Um, and that's just for safety for the patient. We don't want a catheter up near the cervical spine. You don't want that, uh, anything to go wrong at that point. So we don't get a lot of arm. Uh, uh, relief from that, so if they have a really tight upper extremity, we're limited in that, but this is great for lower extremities. Anything below that level of that being bathed. And what it is, is they can give the baclofen, so if I take baclofen orally, it gets me really tired, right? So it goes everywhere in our body, especially our brain, makes us tired. When we have baclofen fed right into the spinal cord, number one, we can give it in a much lower dosage. Um, in orally, we give 10 milligram tablets. Sometimes patients take that eight times a day, so 80 milligrams to 100 milligrams a day. When they go right to the cord, we give it in micrograms. So a big bolus would be like 50 micrograms, but it works directly on where it needs to go, so a lot of patients tolerate it. Plus it's continuous, just, and they can program the pump to whatever it needs. 
So uh, this is a great uh, option for a patient. So if you have somebody that doesn't really know about this, that's really spastic, then uh, you try to find a neurosurgeon in the area that actually does it. We do a spasticity clinic where we evaluate them. They do a test trial where they put uh, a shot, a bolus, into their spine. So they have to do a lumbar puncture. It sucks, but it's, it's good to test because you don't want to be putting in a machinery that doesn't work. And then we test them before and after. We watch them walk. We do their um, spasticity testing, and we see if it helps. Problem with this is that it sometimes helps too much. right? So sometimes spasticity is helpful. Sometimes it keeps them upright. It keeps them walking because their legs are strong with spasticity. I take all the tone away, and now they're just puddles. right? So we want to test that before we add anything in. All right, so here's Andy, um, who you saw in the full evaluation. He was diagnosed with MS at age 25. Um, his main impairments are spasticity and weakness, but most, mostly weakness. He ambulates with a uh, small base quad cane. He has tried baclofen orally, hates it, says he can't work secondary to his sleepiness, or he can't work. He, he wasn't able to work at the time um, due to the sleepiness. And he really is kind of fed up. He, and he's in his 50s. He's been dealing with this for 25 years. He just wants to do exercise and nothing more. He doesn't want to take any more medication, blah, blah, blah. So here he is um, walking, and then I'll come back to that. So you can see he, and this is just mainly weakness, but it's just dragging. And what usually happens, and I can usually tell from a patient walking back to, to me, if they're going to be a balanced patient or if they're going to be a spasticity and weakness patient. Spasticity and weakness patient are going to have all these exaggerated movements, right? So they're throwing their leg around. They're trying to pick up. They're using hip hiking. They're using circumduction. They could even vault on their right side. So they're t if, if I was Andy here, I could vault up on my right side to help clear that left leg, right? So it's all this kind of crazy movement that we see with spasticity and weakness. Balance patients, they don't want to move. They're like this. Don't make me, don't talk to me on my right side. Don't talk to me on my left. I'm walking forward, right? So when they're coming back into our clinic, I know kind of where I'm going to tailor my evaluation because, you know, to test everything in depth is hard to get done, even in our hour evaluation that we get. Um, so to kind of say, okay, he's going to be more spasticity weakness. I'm going to clear the balance systems, but I'm going to look more at his manual muscle testing and his, um, has his spasticity testing. Um, and his function. So that's Andy. So what do we do with Andy? Um, with weakness and spasticity, the biggest thing is that we want to strengthen in uh, functional postures, and specifically the core. So we do want to focus a little bit on the lower extremities, but more in functional um, uh, positions, not necessarily doing any open chain like quad sets or anything like that. We want to do like sit to stands. Um, we do a lot of quad uh, to tall kneel, and I'll show you some videos of that. But positions that also these patients get fatigued. So we don't want to be doing 100 exercises that do one muscle group, then another muscle group, then another muscle group. We, we really want to do functional postures that train core and lower extremity grossly while also stretching in good postures, right? So we kind of get more bang for our buck with functional positions than just uh, like a quad set or some type of just single muscle exercise. We also want to do task-specific training. That's what I tell my students all the time. I'm like, this is why I love neuro so much. You just do what they can't do, right? We want to modify what they can't do in a way that they can do it, and then we continually practice until they can do it. So I don't have to think a lot about what exercises if the patient's not having trouble getting out from a chair. I need to keep doing sit-to-stands in, in different ways, modifying their surface or whatnot, until they can do it, and then we make it harder. Um, Delfampardine, which I talked about, to increase action potentials, we can certainly uh, bring that on board. I think we tried that with uh, Andy for a little bit. But again, he didn't really want any medical management, so it's kind of tough at that point to, to um, break through with him. Um, and then spasticity management through medications, which again, he didn't really want to take. So he's, he is definitely, he has been a tough case as he's progressed because of his, um, his not wanting to try anything else, which is difficult. 
Okay, so here's some examples of our core exercises that we use often. This is my friend Deb. You'll see her a lot um, in Sue's talk. She's obviously a bit weak through the core. Here she's just doing a quad to tall kneel, and then over here she's in quadruped, and she's doing some lower extremity extensions, which is great for her extenders, um, but also great for her core control as she's trying to hold that position. Here is a tall kneel, even harder, so she's a little bit higher center of gravity. Um, which a activates her um, core musculature even more. But you can see really great stretch on her quads here. So right through here, really great stretching, but also strengthening her extenders. So we get a lot of bang for our buck, like I said. Sue so will show you a little bit more exercises with her. Here is more of an example of a task-specific training. So this is Andy again. And you can see if he tries to step up on a step, he's really just hip hiking and trying to swing that leg through. So we don't want that. You'll see in Sue's talk later in the, in the afternoon about motor relearning, neuroplasticity. You don't want to just have a patient do this over and over again, 20 times. You know, if they do that 20 times every like, you know, five times during your session, that's what their brain is going to rewire like. It's going to say, oh, I need all these muscles to do this step up. So what we really do with task specific is, yes, we want them to do the task, but we want them to do it correctly. So I'm giving him a little bit of lift through his anterior tip, but also kind of bending his knee for him so it doesn't lock out because it's a bit weak and then a little spastic. So I'm just um, making his step up more normalized. And we'll practice that maybe 10 times and then I'll take my hands off because you don't want to always have that tactile sensation of always moving his leg. But maybe he gets two really good reps after I take my hands away and then I give him a break and we do something different and then we come back to it. And you can try different ways. So here I had him step up, then I had him doing a step down eccentric. So we're training the muscle in all different ways. But he's doing something that he has to do daily and we're doing it correctly so that he relearns how to do that. Because as you'll also see in Sue's talk, and we put it at the, last, uh, the end of the day, because um, these patients do have a potential to have new neurons firing and more mo motor relearning. It's not this progressive disease that's just depressive and we can never retrain them. There is a lot of evidence out there that's, that we can retrain the brain, um, even in uh, some, something like MS. Um, just briefly, or our orthotics that we can aid in our ambulation. So I showed you that dictus band that was on mic. I wish I invented it. I think I have a picture of it. Yep. So down there at, on your right, down below, that's what a dictus band is. It's just a little cuff that goes around the ankle, and then it's this little bungee cord, and you put these little um, metal uh, hooks in the eyelets of the shoe. And it just kind of gives them a little assist. So these would be the patients, not the force patients, right? Not the ones that I ask them to pick their anterior tip up and they have no activation. But it's the ones that I do a two minute walk test and 30 seconds, 40, 45 seconds in, they start to drag their toe a little bit. They just need that little bit of lift. It's really great. It's lightweight. Uh, it can really work well for patients like that. An AFO is more for our more progressed patients that really don't have, they either have too much spasticity, so we want to actually lock their ankle, um, or they have no activation in their anterior tip and we just need to keep them safe, right? So we want to have them have a 90 degree angle at their ankle. We have hip flexion assist orthosis that was created at a clinic, cl uh, Cleveland Mellon Center, and what that is is it's basically a dict dictus on steroids. So it's now attached at the hip. I just came up with that one. <laughs> just attach the hip, goes all the way down to the ankle. Now when I start to get into this position in that terminal end phase of my, uh, my stance phase, it has all of that bungee cord on stretch. And I lift, and it kind of snaps back. So it gives you a little bit of hip flexion. It is not exaggerated. It's not, it's not like it's not the end all be all fix for these patients. But it can help, again, with those patients that over time fatigue a little bit and it gives them a little bit of lift. So that's out there. And then of course there's the functional electric stimulators. Do you guys get those covered in Canada at all? No. And we don't in the States either. And that's the biggest hurdle with these. I would prescribe these to most every patient that has spasticity and weakness if I could. Um, they're just 
expensive. Uh, in the states, they run about six thousand um, dollars. They stimulate the common peroneal nerve, which activates the anterior tib during swing phase of their gait. So as I pick my leg up to go into swing phase, the uh, stim will turn on and it'll activate the anterior tib through uh, the range. So much better motor relearning neuroplasticity wise than an AFO that just keeps your ankle in, in 90 degrees, right? So we're actually turning on muscles that should be turned on and we're walking more correctly. So I would love to give these to everybody that needs them. So here's a patient, um, her name's Betty. She has bilateral involvement. I think she's my last patient to show you guys. She has bilateral involvement. Her left is worse than her right. She has weakness and spasticity pr predominantly, um, which is impacting her gait. She did actually get an intrathecal baclofen three years prior. They've tried to turn it up and turn it up, but just because of all, this change, all these changes that are going on in the muscle, it's been harder to control her spasticity. So she came in saying to us, you know, I really want to go to Italy with my family, and I know there's going to be cobblestone roads, and I can't be in my wheelchair all the time, but I can't walk like this. Is there anything that you can do? And you can see how not efficient she is with walking. She has almost a step behind pattern. She doesn't even step two. And you can just see her throwing her leg, and she's just trying to move as much as possible. And she was worried, you know, obviously, and, and rightly so, on a cobblestone road, she's not going to be able to clear her foot at all. Um, so she came to us and just said, you know, what can I do? And I guess that's my question to you guys here is, is there any other things that you can think of that we can do with that, that type of patient? So she's already got the interior, she's already got the ITB on, tri, on board. We can certainly dialogue with the, the physician to say, can we up her even more? Can we give her more bullets than we're worrying about this, right? Because she doesn't look that strong either. So what do you think we tried with her? It's kind of a, it's kind of a segue from the previous slide. <laughs> Some FBS, right? So that's basically where we were at with her is like, can we do something where we can activate her anterior tib? Because so her main problems are she's really spastic, right? Spasticity is holding her up. But when we're so spastic, we actually reduce the activation of the antagonist muscle. So if we can turn on the antagonist muscle, we might be able to relax the other muscle, right? So if I turn on the anterior tib, that might start to relax the gastroc. And we have seen that with our patients with FES. So Betty wanted to try the Bioness because the Bioness has an option to have a, a little switch, heel switch. And she's so spastic, she actually walks on her toes. Um, the walk aid only does a tilt sensor, so you have to really have some type of knee bend for it to kind of know when to turn on, which is some of the reasons why you might choose one over the other. But now uh, Bioness has also gone to a no heel sensor, um, but you also, you still have the option to have the heel sensor. So with her, we push the heel sensor just up a little bit more, like on, like on the ball of her foot, because that's where she really walked, so that every time she would come off of it, it would turn on, where you might get some faults in a walk aid like that, because I'm not getting that tilt. So she tried the Bioness, and this is her walking with the Bioness. And you can see how much more efficient she is. She has just better, she even has better knee flexion. It does not purport to do that in any way. It's not advertised to help with knee flexion in any way. But if we can reduce the spasticity of the gastroc, then she's going to have more knee flexion. If you can put the joints in normal alignment, that reduces spasticity. So. The more we can do that, she just keeps walking. She walks right into the carpet because she's just, like so excited. Um, she's just like, ah, okay, bought it that day. She had the means to do so. She said, well, I spend, you know, hundred thousand dollars on my therapies every year. You know, what's five thousand dollars for um, uh, something that's going to help me walk? And she went to Italy with her family, and she was able to use it um, for a couple years before. Um, it progressed to the point where she was in a wheelchair most of the time. But just thinking out of the box just a little bit on a patient just like that, that's just a little bit harder because we've tried everything, but let's bring something on board that we haven't tried yet, and that would be FES. Um, this is just a quick last slide on just the different types of assistive devices. Um, 
we got some input that people wanted to see a little bit different assistive devices. So this is just Betty doing our modeling. Or I'm sorry, this is Debbie doing our modeling. So she was just doing the four-wheeled rolling walker. Um, she loves the four-wheeled wa rolling walker. It's more efficient. We put her on the two-wheeled rolling walker. She still looks good, right? But she doesn't like that uh, she can't maneuver as well. She has just, she's really, she's strong enough. She just has balance and dysfunction. So she just needs a little bit of sensory input. But she also likes the seat and the little basket. So when she shops, she can have that. So that might be a reason why you pick a four-wheeled wa walker over a, a two-wheeled walker. Here we put her in a standard walker. Standard walker is more sturdy, but you can see how less efficient she is. So this would, like sometimes patients think there's a linear way of going, like cane, then maybe two canes or a loft strand crutch, then standard walker, then two-wheeled walker, and then four-wheel walker. Where in, in Debbie's case, four-wheel walker is the number one thing. We don't really want to go to cane or anything else. She's way efficient with that four-wheel walker. So it's just kind of opening up your, your thought process, especially when you talk to patients. Standard walker, I don't really give to anybody anymore other than like a total knee replacement or total hip replacement. And let me tell you, I don't see a lot of those at all, except for when our patients get one. So here she is. Um, I think this is going to be a quad cane. Maybe I just give her a cane. So now I have to guard her, right? So we definitely don't want a cane with her. Um, she's just more hesitant. Um, she, she just doesn't like this. This is a balanced patient, right? This is what Sue's going to talk about. And different than the guy, Andy, who's just throwing his legs all over the place. This is Deb. I don't want to look anywhere else besides down at my feet. So cane wouldn't be good for her. And I believe we do one more, which is the trekking pole. Have anybody used the trekking pole at all? So we love the trekking pole. This is Deal. She's doing a cane right now. And her main problem actually is more her knee is so bad. She actually gets a knee replacement um, after this video was taken. Um, but you can see canes sometimes can have you like leaning toward one side or you're just not putting, you know, putting your weight correctly through your legs. Trekking poles we can do bilaterally. They look a little bit more athletic. Patients seem to like them a little bit more. They can do them like this and they can look like they're getting some exercise in, but it keeps them really upright. So I, don't, I wanted to show you that one because um, sometimes that's not used as much, but patients seem to love it because it's not a cane, but it also doesn't let them lean or have bad posture. They're really standing up straight. So last summary, summary slide is just, our symptom management follows really the general rules of, of disease management, meaning if things aren't working, we do something different. We don't want to just say, oh, we give up. You know, there's nothing left in our toolbox. We have a lot of things in our toolbox. And with our team, we have a ton. Um, we want to diagnose the actual problem with the patient. We want to really do a comprehensive exam, look for those underlying impairments, and really treat towards those. If it's core weakness, we need to do core strengthening. If it's task-specific stuff, we do task-specific. Different types of balance, th balance dysfunctions, which Sue will go over. Not, uh, not being afraid of bringing other parts of your team on and saying, uh, you know what, I think we need some medical management. I need some help with depression or sleep because they're not being able to be in therapy very well because they're not sleeping well, so they're fatigued all the time. Um, and then monitor and adjust the treatment as needed. I can't stress that enough. If the patient is not progressing or not doing as well as you think, just stepping back, reevaluating. Um, a lot of times we have patients that do rehab for like eight weeks, then we let them go on their exercise for six months or so, bring them back in for just one visit just to check in on them because it's a lifelong disease. It's a life. All of these patients that you saw here, I have been seeing for the past 14 years. So we know them very well and we keep them coming back in. Um, so that's it for me.